on the Winning Teams podcast is James Schramko from Australia. He's the owner of Superfast Business and Silver Circle. And James is a fascinating individual to listen to. And there is a ton of content in here that for any business owner, for any leader in business will be absolutely critical because we really does break down all of the things that you need to do to ensure that you're driving the business forward in a really successful way. There are lots of good things in it. He talks about how he breaks down his plans into 12-week chunks, how he ensures that he actually stays on track to achieve what he uh, wants to achieve, and also how he really has built a high-performing team and keeps them engaged and focused on what matters most. So there is so much to be learned from this. I really highly recommend that you listen to it in great detail and do so more than once because there is so much in there. He is the author of uh, the book, Work Less, Make More. And I highly recommend that book to anyone as well. I have read it a couple of times and would be a fan of the content uh, therein. So to get more information, to get more great goodies, go over to the to my website, www.johnmurphyinternational.com. You'll find blog articles, you'll find podcasts, and you'll find all sorts of assets over there. But in the meantime, sit back and enjoy this interview with Jane Schramko. Thank you for joining me here on the Winning Teams podcast. I've been looking forward to doing this. I have to admit, I've been an avid reader of your book, uh, Work Less, Make More. It's well thumbed and is very close to me at my desk. And, and I really want, I encourage everyone to buy it and read it, but I also want to talk a little bit about it here. But thank you so much for giving me your time. Uh, my pleasure, John. It's great. So listen, just to give a little bit of background, I mean, I know that, you know, from talking to you and doing a little bit of work with you, that you have built up a very substantial multi-million dollar business. But I know that earlier in your career, you were in the motor trade, you were very successful at the high end with Mercedes and BMW. And then you decided to kind of pivot and kind of go online and doing something. And I'm just wondering, what was it that drove you to do that? And what was your intention to build when you set out on that journey? Uh, well, I, you know, I, I had a sort of a pinnacle career job. I was the general manager on a circa $300,000 salary. I had a couple of Mercedes-Benz company cars, a laptop and a mobile phone. And I was in my um, 30s, late 20s, early 30s at this stage. So I had a really senior role, and what most people would consider a good job. But I was paying attention to what's happening in the market. I noticed my parents had a travel agency and, and people started to book online instead of going to the agency. And I noticed customers were coming into the showroom knowing more about the models than the manufacturer was telling the dealerships. So I thought, you know, this internet thing, uh, my cousin introduced it to me in about 1995, a very, very early version of it in Australia. And uh, I would crawl on there at night and have a look at things uh, it loaded very slowly but I thought this was really fascinating and uh, over the years I started to feel a little restricted with what we could sell we could really only sell Mercedes-Benz models within a prime market area of say 20 kilometers diameter around the dealership and uh, you know we were competing with seven other Mercedes-Benz dealerships in a similar area we were competing with every other brand so Thought, wouldn't it be good if I could sell things online to anyone in the world 24 hours a day, seven days a week, using my sales skills? Uh, but I didn't know what I would sell, and that, that was um, a challenge. And I kind of stumbled over some of the techniques for the online marketing by accident. When I went looking for a book from Jay Abraham, I found uh, they had these reports and they were giving away the reports and I just had to enter my email address. And when I entered my email address, 
they said, uh, by the way, if you want to give away these reports and if people buy something from us, we'll send you commission. And I thought, well, this, this is really interesting. And I didn't know it at the time, but I was sort of experiencing copywriting and affiliate marketing. So I registered for my affiliate link and uh, set up a little web page on the internet service provider account that I had a free web page with. And uh, that was a bit of a struggle in itself. And of course, I made no sales whatsoever. But now I was starting to get quite interested in figuring out this website thing. I wanted to learn how to build a website. So I started that journey. I'd roll out my little cable and plug it into the telephone socket and, and um, put it into my laptop, uh, which I bought in about 2005. So you know, 10 years after I learned about the internet, I was now going to build myself a website. And it took me ages to figure it out. I had to find a host. I had to get a domain name. I had to try different website building tools. And in the course of that struggle, I discovered that there must be other people like me who are struggling to build a website. So the first product I had real success with was website building software. And I was able to find other people who were struggling and I was able to show them the website that I built using the software. And then I started offering things like bonuses if they purchased through me, through my affiliate link. And the company who had the software was selling it for $198 and I would get $49.25 commission every time someone purchased through my link. And I started selling one and then two and then three and a couple more and it got pretty exciting. And eventually they doubled my commission to $98 and then I started just reinvesting into it and learning about SEO and copywriting and affiliate marketing and just growing that business out and, and then discovering that my clients also had other problems that I could solve. And then I realized that my general management experience was really quite valuable for a lot of the online marketers who were lacking basic business skills, like they'd never hired anyone. They had no idea about strategy or marketing beyond their little tactical game. They didn't know about uh, redundancy or protecting from single source dependency. They had absolutely no idea about financials and reporting and um, projections. So I was able to bring some of the real world skills that I had to this market and they saw value in it and I was able to start coaching people. And uh, yeah. also in that, in that sort of journey, I was providing services to them. I scaled up my search engine optimization to beyond just me to a team of 38 people. I've scaled up my website building from just me to a team of a dozen people. Uh, we had 65 people in my business at one point and then I sold those service businesses and just doubled down on the coaching and then moved into uh, partnerships with businesses that I thought I was a good complement for that I could really help grow and that's sort of where I'm at now and that's really the 14 year journey in a snapshot. Right, and if 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 I look if I look at the 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 business model, I think it's actually just kind of worth explaining the business model that you have with Superfast Business and Silver Circle, and and I'm a member of Superfast Business, so you know, in, in, in transparency. But you know, one of the things that you talk about in the the book of uh, work less and make more is you have created this kind of lifestyle for yourself where you you know very very openly kind of talk about the fact that you go surfing as, as, as often as you can and pretty much do it most days if you if, you, if that's possible uh, at all. How did you kind of go about creating that model? Because to a very large extent, that's kind of the, the ideal that people want to create, but very often don't end up kind of building the model they want and end up with a model they don't want. A lot of people probably don't want. In fact, if you interview eight and nine figure a year online businesses, um, they will always say to you, I wish it was simple like when I was just making a million dollars and keeping 500 grand and had a team of two or three. You know, I wish I could go back to the old days. They all say that um, because they do create these Frankensteins that become difficult. And I was speaking to one of my students today, actually, he started out making about, a, when I was working with him, he was doing about $150,000 a year. He now does $65 million a year but the business has reached a point where he has to have experience or do things that he's not wanting to do and the business is no longer as interesting to him as what, what it was like on the journey through there. So um, we do have to be careful what we wish for. And I didn't get to that in the 
the first step. It's taken me a lot of iterations to get to this point. Uh, I'd say for the first five years, I overworked and uh, I worked too hard and too much. And really part of me creating the book was a guide for people to not have to do the same things that I did so they could get there much quicker. I also thought when I quit my job, you know, I'm going to have a business that has no stock, no staff, no premises, uh, just going to keep it small and simple. But then I realized I need team. So uh, I still don't have physical stock um, aside from the book and some merchandise that I send out. I did go through a phase of DVDs, but I haven't ever had the garage full of crap, uh, you know, a warehouse full of stuff at low margin, uh, logistical nightmares. I have had a lot of team. I've had up to 65 people. and that, So that was one big flip. I actually had as many people in my own business as the dealership that I was running before I quit. And uh, the, the big difference was I was making more money than the dealership in, in pure profit terms. I was making more money than the $50 million a year revenue motor dealership just for my own little business, which to this day has no physical premises. You know, wherever I am is the business. And I have a small team now of six and they're in the Philippines. And I've got a couple of contractors who are you know, globally distributed, places like Puerto Rico, Boise, uh, Melbourne, and uh, Thailand. So you know, we're in a, an age where we can take advantage of geo-arbitrage. The model that I've selected now is essentially where around about 500 people share me and each other. So they get together in an online forum and they can talk to each other. They can consume trainings that are added on an ongoing basis, but also a collective archive of stuff from the past, including live event recordings. And they can also, depending on the level they're at, ask me questions in private, uh, which for some of them is uh, tremendous value at a very affordable rate compared to if they wanted to engage me in their office, uh, you know, much like a lot of corporate consultants would do. They'd have a pretty expensive day rate plus travel costs and accommodation. You're talking thousands or tens of thousands. Um, for my members, they could buy me for a few thousand dollars for a year, uh, depending on the plan they're on. So it's very leveraged. And I think that's the word that comes up a lot in the way that I run my business. I like to find leverage. That That's really what my book is about. It could easily have been called Leverage. But if you have a, enough leverage, you can get big outputs from small inputs. And I figured this business works really well for me, but it wouldn't suit everyone. I think if you're a parent or a nurturer or any kind of teacher, then memberships on subscription can be a great business model. But if you're not those things, it might be a difficult business model to take on and you might want to try a different business model. And luckily there's several business models you can pursue. And when, when you're working with one of your clients, James, how, how do you help them to determine the business model that is the appropriate one for them? I mean, I know it's their choice, what, what they do, but how do you help them find it? Because so many, as we say, kind of create a monster for themselves and they kind of suddenly <laughs> realize, you know, Christ, how did I end up here? You know, I, this wasn't where I yeah. intended to. I've actually just, I've left my corporate job probably and I've kind of get up my own, set up my own business, but now I'm actually more trapped by my business than I was by my job. How do you yeah, help them to actually boss. really shape the model? <laughs> um, well, luckily for me, I've seen a lot of patterns play out over the last decade. You know, I've literally coached thousands of people. So I can foretell them of, of the path they're on and where it ends up. I can predict very accurately what is about to happen like a fortune teller because I've seen it play out over and over and over and over again. So um, for example, in my higher level group, Silver Circle, where the average business is doing $3 million a year plus, the most common goal when someone starts with me is I want to make $10 million a year. Like 85% of them would say that. And then I start with why. Why is this so important to you to make $10 million a year. Um, what can you do with $10 million a year revenue that you can't do with $5 million a year revenue? Let's, let's break it down. What sort of business do you need to be generating $10 million a year? What compromises are involved in that level of revenue? How many people will you need to hire? What type of business model is going to suit um, what you're prepared to commit to for that? You know, and what's the end play here? Is it a cash cow to 
produce income? Is it something you just want to build up and sell and reinvest all the way and then get a big payout? Or is it something in the middle? So I go through a thorough diagnostic and I ask a lot of questions and from their inputs and preferences and their skill set and their list of assets and uh, their fortitude and uh, resilience and stick to itiveness, I can gather what sort of business model might suit them and I can give them a few choices and I can tell them the pros and cons of uh, pursuing different ones. Okay. And you know, I know one of the things that you know people get caught up in, in in business, and I see it coaching with with my own clients, is this, you know, the whole process of really being very good and disciplined about planning and being clear about what it is that you're focusing on and be on the prioritization. And you talk about it in the book, and it's a, it's a kind of an approach that I would I would share in terms of you kind of work in in twelve week cycles. And I just thought, could you just explain to people how to do that and how to actually then take that down from the 12 week cycle into what I'm actually going to focus on this week and this day? Yeah. So, um, in, in the online field, especially, it's, it's probably good not to have, you know, a two year plan or five year plan is, is probably not that useful. Uh, certainly, I, I have been doing some things for over 10 years. For example, I've had a membership for over 10 years. I've been podcasting for over 10 years and I've been running live events for over 10 years. So I've been able to commit to long-term activities. And I like what um, Jeff Bezos talks about, the founder of Amazon. He talks about not worrying about what's going to change, but think more about what's going to stay the same. So for his business, he knows people want the best selection at the lowest prices with the fastest delivery. And if he can make that his filter, doesn't have to worry so much about long-term plans because that's his filter, the way that he views everything through that lens. And I'm more or less the same. I, I had this philosophy, I want a lifetime customer. What can I do to help a customer forever? And that's a good lens to look through. So I don't worry about to-do lists and I don't worry about micro planning every part of my week or month or 12 weeks. What I do worry about is distractions. Uh, when I was sitting there as a general manager in the dealership, I used to get people inundating us with offers, you know, trying to sell us plate frames, umbrellas, newspaper advertising, TV commercials, radio ads, like everyone was coming in with their plan for us, but that wasn't in our plan. So one of the beauties of a 12 week plan is you can say to any um, outside interference, you can say, thanks for your uh, inquiry. I'm going to put it down for review at the 12 week point and I'm going to check in. So much like a train journey with platforms where we're stopping along the way, we can say, look, I'm going to look at that at the next stop. So I'm just going to put that to the side for now. And I imagine in the corporate world, you'd be quite used to a company saying, listen, uh, we've already done our budget for this quarter or this financial year. So come back to us and pitch us for next financial year. I mean, they're doing exactly the same thing they're putting up a barrier and putting it on review later on. So you can do that in your own business. If you don't have a 12 week check-in, there's a good chance you're just getting dragged around by whoever knocks on your door today. And I like the golden rule. If someone's contacting you, then you're probably part of their agenda. Uh, but if you're contacting them, then they're a part of your agenda. And it's very easy to get dragged off course unless you have a, a plan. So what I like to do with my team is we like to have a theme or something we're working on. So right now in my team, we are tuning our search engine optimization. We are uh, making our emails more deliverable and we're speeding up our website. So there's three things my team are working on right now that will take them a week or two to do. And when that's done, then we'll move on to the next objective. So I'll just figure out of all the things we could do, where is the most impact going to come from? And as Peter Drucker said, it's, it's all about doing the right things. So I'll assess what we could work on and then we'll move into the next thing. But I don't put it on my team's plate and I don't keep it in the front of my awareness until we get to that point. So I keep a little list of high impact ideas in a spreadsheet. And when I'm looking for the next thing, I'll just go and look through it and find of all the things there, which one makes the most sense for us right now and we do that. Now using this technique, I've been able to maintain a solid six figure income per month for 10 years straight. And it's even rare that I would find a customer who could say that without a dip. 
because we're constantly refining and tuning our machine like Kaizen, never ending cycle of improvement. And I have a feeling I know what the next things we're gonna do after that will be. So for me, it will be working on the next book and creating small information products to feed the front end of my membership. But I won't bear that onto the team until they're done with the current tasks. Yeah. One of the things that I that I really liked in your book, and it comes back to your planning and your kind of weekly planning, is to kind of have a kind of one high impact task that you're going to focus on completing yeah. in that week. And on the basis, I think you said, you know, if you do that for 50 weeks in the year, you've actually, yeah. you know, you've done 50 high impact things in the year and that's going to that's going to add up to being a pretty successful year. Yeah, I mean, when I do a coaching call, I could end the call with 50 things for them to do, or I could just tell them the one thing. Of all the stuff we talked about, the one thing that's going to make the biggest difference, and I just want them to do that for the next week. Yeah, next week, yeah. we can talk about what the next biggest thing would be. It might be on the list, it might be something new. And I found they're getting tremendous success with that, um, because you know, I think one of the problems with being an entrepreneur or any senior level executive is you've got too much on your plate. It's overload, it's overwhelmed. And my goal is to tell people, you know what? Forget about all that stuff. Just drop it off your plate. Tear up your to-do list. Just put one post-it note, the one thing that you want to get done. Like I've got a post-it note right now on my computer and there's only one thing that I'm focused on right now. And I will work on that one thing until it's done. And it should take me a couple of days, maybe up to a week. When it's done, then I'll replace that with the next thing. And I don't need a to-do list because everything else is really not important compared to that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's really interesting. I, I had a conversation with a company that I was doing some work with uh, recently. And just as part of the, 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 the session with the senior team, it became kind of clear to me that probably their priorities were a little bit askew. And I just asked a very simple question. I said, you know, what are the top three priorities for the team? over the next six months and that conversation took the best part of four hours wow yeah that's a so good reason why I, I left corporate i find it very <laughs> difficult to to deal with um bureaucracy and vagueness and um cya management you know cover your ass who's to blame yeah. and passing the buck I, like I wouldn't tolerate a four hour conversation with anybody on any topic. My go to yeah. would be, okay, if the plane is going down and you had to grab a parachute and you're only allowed one of these items, which one would it be? And does everyone else in your team know that's the most important thing? And that's a yeah. five minute conversation. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You also talk in the book about the 80-20, but then you kind of take the 80-20 to the 80-20 of 80-20. Can you maybe yeah. just talk a little bit about that? Because I found that really powerful. Yeah, I did too. You know, when I first discovered that it's fractal, uh, which means it works on itself, it kind of blew my mind a bit. And it, and it made me reflect on a time where I had uh, a boss who was very ineffective. He was sort of in, a, he was absent most of the time and would never make a decision or a choice. Or I'd send things up to his office for review or a decision and then he just wouldn't make any. And what I discovered is that it almost didn't matter. Like almost nothing was that urgent that the ground didn't open up and just devour us. <laughs> like <laughs> the bottom line is so few things are important. We think they are, but they're not. And you could safely stop doing most of the things on your to-do list and it would make absolutely no difference. And you don't have to look far for examples. I'm thinking about your wardrobe. You probably have one or two favorite items of clothing that you tend to wear a lot and then some stuff that's in a vacuum sealed bag up the back of the closet that you never ever wear, or maybe never even, well, if, if there's a, a lady in the house, she's probably got things with labels on it stashed away there that were purchased on sale that have never been worn once, not mentioning any names here, but this is, you know, and the, but there'll be the favorite item that gets worn all the time, or the favorite handbag, or the favorite whatever. Like think about your phone, how much do you use your phone versus other gadgets like your camera, or a video recorder or your PlayStation or whatever. Like we tend to use some things a lot and other things hardly ever. It's the same for business. Of all your product lines or SKU items or clients, some of them are just way better than others. Uh, if you're gonna be a guest on podcasts, some of them will be way more leveraged than others. And it's worth identifying which ones are those 
and zooming in on the ones that are vital and just ignoring the rest. And you'll find that you can actually get a lot more leverage that way if you only focus on the right ones and dump the rest. It's kind of like dipping a magnet into a box of wood chips and looking for the metal filings. Like if metal filings were the, the good thing and wood chips were useless, it's worth creating a magnet to, to draw them out. So that's why I like decision making filters or tools that help you identify which things are high impact. So some people use the Eisenhower matrix, the urgent versus important filter, because items that are neither urgent nor important, I mean, you could forget about them. Uh, and then there's some things that are really important that aren't necessarily urgent, like paying your tax. They don't become urgent until you get the penalty notice or you, they threaten to take you to, to jail if you don't pay. And then they become urgent and important. Uh, but you want to look out for things like that that are really important that have to get done and put them into your scheduler. And then, of course, the urgent stuff like renewing a domain name or paying your team, that absolutely has to get done. So that has to become a routine. It has to become automatic habit and a system should be created around it to make it happen like clockwork. One of the things that you, and I must say that I, I've, I've also learned from you, is the whole importance of what you talk about systems and processes and, you know, and having your standard operating processes. Because a lot of businesses, you know, big and small, don't really have that. They're kind of, you know, people have an idea what they are or they have, an, you know, but everything then gets very repetitive and everybody has to get trained time and time again. Talk a little bit about what, what the importance of that and how to actually optimize that and how it really can leverage your business. Well, it's, it's, it's um, making things effective. So if you hire someone to do a task and then they leave, then you have to hire someone again and then teach them a task. So that is repetitive. Um, I like to have two people who can do every task in the business. And I call that the NOAA principle, obviously after you know two animals on the ark. Uh, so imagine that you have a business and you've got a team. What I like to do is list all the people down the left-hand column in your business and then across the right-hand column, list all the tasks that happen in the business and put a cross in the, or color the square in the box where someone can actually do that task. And what I'm looking for is at least two people can do every task. That way, if someone leaves, then that person who still knows how to do the task can train the next person to do it without you having to get involved. So that's very effective. But you can even apply this in your regular life. Like I just spent a week surfing in the Philippines. And when I was spending that week, I had certain challenges during the week that uh, required things to happen next time I go. I'm going back there in a month, right? During that week, I snapped a leg rope. I had a board damaged that required repair. I had uh, I ran out of wax, uh, or I had, had to use some crappy wax that wasn't very good. And I needed sun cream that uh, I didn't bring the, the strong enough zinc. And um, also, I luckily took a hat, but I left my hat there for next time. And also, the board I had wasn't quite the right size for the conditions. So when I was there, I literally created an SOP. And it's like Philippine Surfing SOP. And I wrote down the things I must take. I've got to take strong leg rope, a bigger board, sun cream, a hat. And, and when I got back to Sydney, I opened up my SOP. I went to the surf shop today, and I restocked. I bought leg ropes, I've got my board bag out, I've packed a bigger board for next time, I've put the sun cream in the bag, and so I'm ready to go. Even if it's a month from now, but my bag is ready to go. My SOP is done, and now I don't have to think about it, I have to worry about it. There's a very low chance that I'll, the day to come to, to go to the airport will arrive, and then I don't, I'm like, oh, panic, oh, gee, what is it, I need it again, or oh, how am I going to get to the shop? Because you know, people run their business like that, and I think it's crazy. So if you're going to do anything more than once, create an SOP. And it could be as simple as in your notes app on your phone. It could be a Google document you share with everyone in the business who's going to need that SOP. And have a simple naming convention. Call it SOP and then name, name it what it is. It could be a posting video SOP. It could be a bookkeeping SOP. And put it into simple steps that anyone could follow, even if they're picking it up for the first time and then have two people understand that SOP and let them update it as things change.
Very simple, but very, very profound. And that kind of leads me to talk about the, the, the team, because as you said, you could have equally called your book leverage. But one element of leverage is is hiring, you know, finding, hiring and but most of all, keeping the team. Now, from what I understand, your team is remote. It's in the Philippines. So you're based primarily yeah. in Sydney. So, you know, and that adds a, a kind of an, an additional dimension to that. So for anybody building a team, you know, one is kind of finding the people. You know, two is kind of training and developing the, the, the people. But the third, a really important part, is the retention of the people. And you've been really successful because I think your your people are kind of up to 10 years with you, which is which is quite an achievement. What do you think have been the differentiators that have ensured that you've been able to keep the talented and trained and developed people beyond what would normally be expected? Uh, so good selection. I, I mean, look, a couple of things for context. In, in my role as general manager and the sales manager before that, or general sales manager, sales manager, I hired and trained a lot, lot of people over the years, like over 100. And I created systems. The system was so good that Mercedes-Benz asked me to teach the other managers what I was doing because I was able to produce top, top salespeople from scratch with my systems. So I applied my systems to my own business and I recruit well. So I, I have good um, pre-interview criteria filled out in advance, the, the attributes that I'm looking for in a candidate that I uh, that like a must-haves or desirables. I will uh, interview and screen multiple people. I'll have multiple interviews and I'll reference check. So I'm not skipping any steps and then I hire and then I train them really well. I give them lots of my resource and time and attention in the beginning and nurture them and give them great onboarding. And then I make myself an employer of choice. I give them good pay. I pay early. I give them really good flexible conditions. I encourage them and praise them and reward them. And I ask them to find things they're interested in and passionate about and work on those projects within our business. And We've got to quite an evolved state now. We have no official hours, no official days. Uh, we pay this. We pay twice a month the same amount uh, each month, ongoing. We have regular pay rises as the business succeeds and grows. Then their pay succeeds and grows. We do have an incentive at the end of the year. I tip back some profits from one of our projects back to them, which they're directly responsible for growing. The more profit they can make from that project, the more they get as a distribution. So it's a very direct and controllable reward, which is important. I have very open communication. We have a weekly team meeting, but it's about 12 minutes long for six people. I interact with my team individually uh, in Slack channels, which is an online platform for collaboration. And I also go and visit my team. I've visited my team every year for probably the last seven or eight years. I've been to the Philippines about uh, so many times my passport's getting thick, maybe 16 to 18 times, something like that. And I, I know my, my team very well. I know about their culture. I know some of the words in their language. I know about their family. I know what they like to eat. I know where they live. And they know all about me and we, we're very transparent. We report uh, lead and lag metrics daily in our channel as a group. And I talk very often about what we're trying to do as a business and who we are, what our values are, um, what success looks like, what things we're doing well, where we can really improve. Uh, and also through the course of what we do as a business coach, we get to see a lot of cata catastrophes unfolding in other businesses. They, they see uh, some terrible leadership habits. They see some crash and burn businesses uh, in our environment. You know, people have to leave the community because their business ran aground because of some crazy thing happening. Like they built their whole thing on Facebook or YouTube and their channel got stopped or whatever. And they, they have to leave because they've run out of money. Like I think they're aware they're in a good place. And that, as you said, they're coming up to 10 years now. So I've got the most incredible people working in my team. And I'm also happy to train them and invest in them. I, I buy them courses. I send them the logins. They go through them. They they bid for them. When I, when I say, listen, we need to learn about this in our business, who would like to do it? And they, they put their hand up and they say, yes, I'd like to do that. And away they go and they can work on it when they want and, and they, they do their, um, they just seem to build a routine. I've just told them what's important for us. Things that are important for us, we want seven day a week support. 
we want highly accurate work. Uh, we want double checking of things. I just don't. I don't want drama. So if we can reduce mm -hmm. drama, then I'm a really happy boss, and they're going to have a happy life. And I want them to have a good life, like me. It's hard for them to post about me surfing and all of this all the time, and then they're like slaves in the textile mill, chained to the machine. I don't want them to do that. I want them to take yeah. their kids to school. I want them to take their partners to the shops on a weekday and watch a movie. Uh, but when we need them, they're there. They're the most incredibly supportive and loyal uh, high performers. And I don't work them to the bone. They, they get rests and then we do little sprints with little mini projects that are challenging. And then we all catch up and go surfing together. Fantastic. I mean, to be, to be honest, James, if anybody just kind of listened back to that, the answer that you gave to that question, uh, there is just so much in there about leadership, about developing, building teams, and about really optimizing and 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 and, and leveraging teams. So that that is incredible. Could I ask you the one of the, the the principles that Warren Buffett often talks about is that you know he said in any business, irrespective of kind of how big or how small, there are you know kind of five maybe five things that you need to have on your dashboard, and if you keep an eye on those five things, you've got a pretty good chance of having a successful business. And I'm just wondering, if you were picking the five things on your dashboard, what would they be? Well, it'd probably be the five things on my dashboard, because <laughs> I've already <laughs> picked. Um, I would call that, I, I'd say it's pretty accurate. Uh, and one thing that I've noticed with some of the businesses who struggle is they have no idea what's going on in their business. Um, Interesting, like we have really good reporting. I mean, we had expensive accountants in the Mercedes dealership benchmarking us with all the other dealerships. We had the big firms in there giving us lots of spreadsheets and stock matrices and, you know, numbers, 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 spreadsheets from the manufacturer and budgets and targets and stuff. So I was very familiar with it. And I actually studied some accounting. So I don't mind the numbers. I, I track the number of current members of Superfast Business and Silver Circle because that's a fantastic health indicator. That directly translates to revenue. Uh, we have a high profit margin business, so it more or less tracks to profit as well. Uh, I like to track the number of emails we send in a month because the number of emails directly relates to the number of offers because every email has an offer or call to action. If we drop our number of emails, it probably means we're not doing as many podcasts or posting as many videos. It means not as many people will see our offer, which means they're not going into our email system, which means they're not going to buy. So it's a fantastic lead metric. If we, if we send 60,000 emails a month, we will make more sales in a month from now than if we send 30,000 emails. I also like to see how many people visited our website in the last 30 days. And I like to compare this week versus a month ago versus six months ago for all of these numbers. So I get a very strong trend pattern. If I can have a look at how many members do I have in Silver Circle this month versus last month versus six months ago, I mean, it's so flat you could put a spirit level on it. I always keep 30 members. But if I dip down to 25 or 20, then I know that I'm going to take a hit on revenue for that division. Uh, I also want to know how many people listen to our podcast over the last 30 days because that number is a pretty good lead metric in terms of how many people are going to join or buy. I also want to know how many email subscribers we have in our current database because that tracks uh, how many people come in versus how many leave the list. And, and if you keep sending emails, you'll have some people leave. But if you keep offering podcasts and content upgrades and things people can download, then people are going to arrive. So I want that number to slowly increase over time. But importantly, I want it to be with the caveat that it must be deliverable. You know, I want a minimum 30% open rate. I want uh, it to go in the in the primary inbox, not the junk folder. And, and uh, you know, I want I want to have a very low complaint or spam rate, you know, virtually nothing. So there's some of the things that I track on a daily basis that our whole team looks at and shares. And um, then every 10 days, I get a pretty high level product comparison. So I get a, a line by line product item from Superfast Business, Silver Circle, um, failed transactions and refunds, if there are any, which is very low. Um, and revenue share income and some of our other associated uh, income. On, so I get that on the, the 10th and the 20th and then month end. Month end I get a full P&L, absolutely every line item 
every single tool we use in the business, every staff cost allocated per, per department compared to the previous month and any large expenses notated. So if we have a conference or we buy a annual subscription to hosting or whatever, then it, it'll show a large amount and it'll show my profit in, you know, amount and percentage versus the month prior. And using this system, we're very accurately able to predict our annual revenue, our profit. <clears throat> we can pay our tax instalments. Uh, we, uh, the team know that we're very secure. Only three people see that report because it's probably not important for the rest of the team. But <clears throat> the two people who do see it are more than welcome to tell the rest of the team that we're in solid financial standing. Okay, pretty good. So for you, James, I mean, you, you've, you've kind of built this business, you've built a, a very successful business, and I know that you're very interested in kind of, you know, the whole health side of your life and kind of getting that balance right. How do you keep yourself motivated? Um, I surf. I dream and obsess of surfing. I surf every day. I think about it a lot. Um, that's enough for me. I'm keen to wake up and check the forecast and I want to get a good surf in each day. And if my business funds that lifestyle, then it's a great trade-off. And then even more importantly, I've been able to set my filters now to have extraordinary clients. I mean, even today, my client roster today has been inspirational. I've spoken with Ezra Firestone, Pat Flynn, um, Jared Robinson, Kelly Exeter, my book author, uh, Tim Reed, a guy I ran a podcast with Freedom Ocean for years, um, just uh, Will Wang, you know, just super talented, switched on people doing amazing stuff and that's a work day for me. And I still manage to surf and, and cook meals for my baby and um, do this podcast, you know, so it's engaging and interesting work. And then I make sure I have four days off a week. So that's the other thing. I want to sharpen the saw. I want time to think. I don't want appointments all the time. I'm getting older now. Uh, I've got five kids. I've, I'm interested in, in building out investment portfolios. I'm always interested in um, helping my partners grow their business. So I've got plenty of things that I can do, and but also like downtime. I'm a bit of a homebody actually in, in between my houses. I live here and the Philippines. Uh, and uh, and I travel a little bit, you know, which so life, I enjoy. Life, and... life, is, life is pretty good for you. So um, before we wrap up, something that I ask everybody, I, I'm going to ask you about a book, but I'm going to mention your own book, um, and which, is, which really is good. I mean, I, I, have, I genuinely have read it a few times. So, um, <laughs> Me and, too. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can imagine. And, and every time I pick it up and, and look into it, there's kind of something else that I see that I, I didn't quite get the first time. So I do highly recommend it. But just curious, I Thank know you. that you're an avid reader. I know that you really, because uh, you, you interview some great people on your podcast as well, which is a, which is a great podcast. Book that you've come across recently that has had a significant impact upon you and why? Recently, I would say Indistractable by Neil. Oh, yeah. Good, yeah. I like that book because um, he talks about pain management. He talks about how we only ever do things to avoid pain. So it's really understanding your drivers and why you get distracted and unfocused. Uh, and I thought there was some good tips in there, like in in the word distraction is a clue because you've got the word traction embedded in there. And so a distraction is anything that is the opposite of traction. So traction is moving, making forward progress. Distraction is anything that gets in the way of that. But then within the word traction is the word action which is ultimately what gets you the traction. You actually have to do something. And I like that because it kind of falls back on the old Peter Drucker thing, you know, doing the right things. I would say uh, the real key outcome of that is if you want to succeed, then you should focus on doing the right things and avoid things that take you off track. And you can only claim that you're being distracted if you're being taken off track for something that was making positive progress. Like if, if you didn't have a plan for positive progress, so you're going back to your sort of 12 week thing, then you can't claim to be distracted because you, it's not distracting you from anything in particular. Yeah, I, 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 I read the book based on the interview that you did with Nair, and I thought, I, thought it was a, I thought it was a really excellent book. So I, I, would, I would fully endorse that. It just for the other final question to ask you is that what you do, I mean, I know you do the surfing, but what do you do to, to your rituals on a daily basis that really enrich your day and 
ensure that you are operating at the optimum? Uh, look, I, I do some. Uh, um, I do good sleep. I think sleep's important. So I go to bed early enough and I wake up naturally without an alarm clock. And by having four days of no appointments, I can I can really just lean into that. I can just go to bed when I want, wake up when, when it's right. And I drink water, I take some supplements, I surf every day. That's a big one because it's it's a, it's an analog activity. There's no technology involved. Yeah. I'm walking barefoot, I'm grounded, you know, in the in the water. Um during winter it's like a bit of an ice cream dip. Um it's challenging and, and you need resilience for it to take on sometimes less than optimal conditions. Um, there's lots of life lessons in it. You get beaten up sometimes by the waves. Mother Nature um, throws challenges at you. It, it pushes your personal limits. So that's a huge one. It, it's, it develops me mentally, physically, uh, emotionally. It's the place I soak out um, anger or stress. It's the place where I um, you know, I can look up at a flock of birds flying in a V pattern and just think, wow, that is amazing. You know, or a dolphin swimming next to me. It's like, wow. Uh, and you just got to pinch yourself sometimes. You just think this is incredible. This is a weekday. You know, people are in their stupid suits and ties going up and down in elevators in the city. I don't get it. I can't understand why anyone would do that optionally. You know, and, and you have a choice. That's the big discovery. I, I want to create a book around the concept of time travel because I really think I've been able to slow things right down to you know, when I was in a job, I just remember hardly even having time for lunch. Everything was frantic and it was crazy and the stress levels were through the roof and the pressure and the, the bastardry in the motor vehicle industry and the you know male domination and the fudging of numbers and reports. It was like you when you're in it, you think that's that's like, you know, it's like war. No. And I know just about everyone I worked with at that level has some kind of post-stress traumatic disorder or you know, post-traumatic stress disorder um, from that environment. And I've just soaked it out now through six years of surfing. So that is by far and away life-changing number one. Everything else pales. But after that, it's eating well. Uh, I've done rounds of blood work, DNA tests and all sorts of things to tune uh, my food intake and to understand about my body. I've freed myself up from some severe osteoarthritis, neck pain and osteophytes and uh, through the, the community that I have, getting good good access to um, ideas and, and um, techniques and food protocols that are probably still making their way into normal conversation. But there's been some progress on, on that. And um, you know, really working on my relationships and family time and setting boundaries. That um, as a kind of reformed workaholic, um, I look at guys like Gary V and, and even Warren Buffett in a way who thinks that money's how you keep score. I and mean, Gary thinks thinks it's all about the hustle and you know grinding and stuff. I I just think well, good luck to those guys, but that's not what I want. And I, there's nothing wrong with having a small profitable business. You don't have to be the king of the pile. You don't need a ten million dollar business. Well, I don't. You don't need to be a CEO of a big company having fabulous lunches and corporate retreats and stuff like that's the old world I left, and I, I couldn't be happier. Well, you're a great example of it, James, and you certainly do live the what you preach, and which is which is which is admirable, and. Uh, I've been looking forward to this interview, and boy, you have not disappointed. You've given a load of content, <laughs> and uh, and and I really appreciate that. As I said, I recommend anyone to go and buy the book. Where can people reach out and connect with you? Because I'm sure people will want to. Oh, you can send me an email, James at superfastbusiness.com. Uh, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Superfast Business, uh, the website. It's got lots and lots of podcasts and. Uh, email updates when we put a new show out. Uh, LinkedIn, I pick pick your choice. I'll I'll check it occasionally. <laughs> yeah, so but you, people will find you. I can I can guarantee you people will find you. James, yeah. thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I'm sorry that I kept you longer away from cooking dinner for your daughter, but I hopefully you'll actually get <laughs> back right. to that now. There's something Seriously. therapeutic about it. Like I buy this organic foods and then I cut them up and steam them and then blend them and feed her. There's like no additives. She seems to love it. 
I think if we ate that, we'd we'd be in perfect health as well. <laughs> so uh, I'm just really enjoying the simple things that we probably gloss over the first time around. Uh, so that's good. And thanks for being such a great host as well. It's been very enjoyable sharing some information today. Uh, James, it's been a real pleasure. And listen, I look forward to talking to you real soon. You take care. Thank you.